session of the pre-conference symposium of SimHealth 2023 on the topic, Role of Real-World Evidence in Clinical Trials. Real-world evidence is a powerful tool for answering questions that are difficult to study in clinical trials. It can help us understand how new therapies work for everyone who requires them, including those who do not take part in clinical trials. Real-world evidence is now used to support the market authorization applications for investigational products, post-marketing surveillance, health technology assessments, comparative effectiveness research, and other applications. To enlighten us on this topic of real-world evidence, we have with us Ms. Indrani Kakade, consultant in the area of clinical trials. Ma'am was the head of the biometrics and data services in Clayanthar Research Limited and works in data operations in global pharma and outsourcing industry. Ma'am was the director of clinical development, Cyformax, and the director of operation in Cognizant Technology Solutions. She has worked at Pfizer Global Research Development. The Biotechnology Industry Research Assistant Council acknowledged Indrani Ma'am as a panelist of Scientific Expert Committee for National Biopharma Mission, Government of India. She has attained various certifications like the Clinical Trials, International Council for Harmonizations, Good Clinical Practices, Quality, and Six Sigma. She has completed her B-Farm and M-Farm from the Pune College of Pharmacy, Pune. We invite you, ma'am, to elaborate on this topic of role of real-world evidence in clinical trials. Before I start, how many of you have heard of real-world data and uh, real-world evidence? Nobody? I can just, just see one hand raised there. Wow. So I'm going to take two more hours to explain to you. Well, just joking. So let, let's start without uh, too much of a... Uh... So today's agenda, in short, is going to be uh, what are clinical trials, because obviously we are going to talk of uh, the role of real-world data and real-world evidence in clinical trials. So we have to understand and uh, know what are clinical trials to be able to appreciate the role of real-world evidence in clinical trials. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, some definitions related to that. Uh, what is RWE and what is the difference with respect to RWD? Because these two terms are pretty much, uh, you know, used um, alternatively or synonymously. Uh, before we jump into how real-world evidence is important, we also need to understand a historical perspective of when did this come into picture, when did uh, real-world evidence and data uh, start being appreciated by the regulators and how it has evolved over a period of years. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, the data sources and types of uh, real-world studies without getting into too much of details and, the uh, and theory about it. Um, and uh, as with everything in life, there are challenges with real-world data uh, studies also. I'll uh, talk to you about those as well. And uh, some examples of uh, real-world um, real world examples of how real-world data has been used by the regulators and pharma industry to get newer medications, repurpose certain new drugs uh, for uh, the recent uh, diseases and approvals, regulatory approvals. So, okay, I'm going to... So before we start, let's look at what are clinical trials. So clinical trials are studies conducted to collect safety and efficacy of a new drug or a biological product. I hope everybody knows uh, at least of uh, this definition. Okay, cool. The process begins at a preclinical stage with extensive laboratory research, and this entire thing takes about uh, you know anywhere between seven to twelve to fifteen years to get a new drug molecule to the market. So one needs to appreciate the length and the breadth of the operations that is required to get a drug into the market. There are various phases of clinical trials. I'm sure everybody knows about that. Phase one, two, three, four. Have you guys heard about it? Yes, yes cool. So I won't go get into too, many, too much of details, but uh, phase one essentially is, uh, or other studies that are conducted on safety volunteers. Uh, very limited in numbers, somewhere between 20 or 30 to uh, 200 on the, on the outer side. Uh, 
once that gets done, the drug moves into uh, a phase two st stage where uh, the same drug is tried now into a slightly higher number of population or higher number of patient population, if you can call it that. Uh, and uh, the period is typically from one year to two and a half to three years. Once the drug again becomes successful um, at phase two, and then they decide to take it to the next level, uh, then comes a phase three uh, trials, which are global trials, which are multicentric trials. And the drugs are then uh, tried on a very large patient population. And these are, you know, as you said, COVID trials and very large trials in the recent times that we've seen. And uh, we will talk about phase four trials where the real world data um, plays a key role. And we'll talk about it in our subsequent slides. This is a pictorial representation of um, what really happens uh, in the clinical trial space. As, and as you can see, the cost of getting a new drug to the market is somewhere between you know, 50 billion to 80, 90 billion uh, with oncology research at the top of the drug development uh, clinical trials market. The largest market is North America, and uh, the fastest growing market is now Asia Pacific region, mainly because uh, the new drugs and uh, the new diseases are coming up, and also new CROs are coming up uh, in these regions, and the patient population availability uh, into certain geographies is making the companies plan their studies in these areas. 12 to 15 years of research is already what we've spoken of on the last slide. And uh, as you know, this is a very, very high um, uh, cost process and entire uh, drug development process is a very, very costly affair. And hence, it is so much important to get the real data from the real population to do drug development and getting a drug successfully into, into the market without having too many market recalls or very uh, serious adverse event profiles. Let's look at a report uh, which was published very, very recently by the IQVIA Institute. And uh, as you can see, the oncology and, rare, and the rare diseases tops the uh, research uh, that utilizes real world data and followed by some uh, studies in ear and uh, eye infections. So the numbers are pretty much there for you to look at. Oncology still remains at the top with 38% of the overall pipeline uh, being uh, attributed to the oncology research. And all of us know why, because the cancer rate is really growing at a very, very fast speed. And all the companies are looking at getting newer and successful mo molecules to the market, which also involves a lot of biologics uh, uh, drug uh, development. So far clear? Any questions on any slides? Uh, the drug discovery process and the applications of real-world data is pretty much in every stage of uh, drug development life cycle. As you can see, uh, it happens in the drug discovery process where real-world data is used to uh, identify certain uh, biomarkers, identify certain receptors. In clinical studies, they are used for operational uh, purposes, like trying to identify patient population, trying to identify patient cohorts, uh, population of interest, and also to uh, narrow down on certain eligibility criteria depending on uh, concomitant medication, comorbidity data. A lot of uh, data is being used to proactively mine and analyze data before the clinical trials are planned. And post-marketing, as uh, Mr. Moindon uh, just now mentioned, um, a lot of data also gets uh, extracted, mined, analyzed. There's a big initiative by US FDA called FDA Sentinel. Please go and have a look at it, where uh, it's a partnership between the uh, industry and uh, FDA, where they are uh, looking at, I think 17 companies have tried tied up for that. They have anonymized the data, and they're trying to mine certain information uh, for uh, drug safety um, evaluation and other things. And uh, last but not the least, in post-marketing area, there, it's also used in uh, pragmatic studies, which are very, very close to uh, real-world studies, but the focus is more on the treatment and outcome correlation, um, and uh, the physician is uh, somebody who decides what medication needs to be given to 
a particular patient, unlike a clinical trial where you know it's already predetermined based on the uh, randomization scheme and the randomization schedule. I'll move to the next slide. Uh, so we've spoken a lot about RWA and RWE without even getting into the definitions of what is real-world data and what is um, uh, real-world evidence. So real-world data are the data relating to the patient's health status and uh, the delivery of healthcare and or delivery of healthcare, which is routinely collected from a variety of sources. So variety of sources, can, can somebody tell me what could be a source which is collected for a patient data collection? Lab Absolutely, lab report is one of them. Any others? Sorry? I can't hear, somebody says. Patient something. Yeah, patient's health, yeah, yeah, great. Patient's health records, um, absolutely. That is another source of data for the real world. So real world essentially is everything and anything that uh, gives us an insight or availability of data for a patient, a patient's health records. This, uh, these um, observations or data can also be collected through a caregiver. So for example, there is an Alzheimer's patient, there is a Parkinson's patient but he or she is unable to um, you know, collect the data, but a caregiver is collecting that data. That also becomes a source of real-world data. And real-world evidence is what? And any analysis of the real-world data to be able to justify uh, the evidence and the potential use of that particular real-world is real-world evidence. So any study that's conducted on real-world data to provide evidence or usefulness is real-world evidence. And these two terms are synonymously used uh, many a times. Okay, let's go to uh, the potential sources of real world data. And as some of you have rightly said, uh, it does uh, involve lab data. It does uh, involve, uh, you know, electronic health records, electronic medical records, administrative and claims data, which is the insurance claims data drug and disease registries, um, and patient-generated data like mobile devices, sensors, etc. And last but not the least, the social media and other data. Um, the electronic health records are, uh, you know, wider in, in terms of their availability and usage because this comes from uh, multiple systems where a patient's data gets logged in at a, at a, over a period of time, whereas electronic medical record could be just one paper of a patient's uh, health. Like, if I go to a doctor, my doctor will give a prescription and that becomes my EMR in, in that sense. But EHR is my big fat file for the last 10 years where, you know, I get to see what has happened to my health over a period of time. So, in that sense, EHR are uh, slightly more uh, broader in scope, um, but could have a similar kind of data. Um, okay, interestingly, I was uh, reading an article, and how is this data collected? A lot of you still use apps, right? Who uh, the smartwatches? How many of you are smart, wearing smartwatches? I'm an old school person. I don't want my data to be tracked, but um, yeah, a lot of people do use smartwatches, right? And this data gets collected through what? An app. So in 2022, 90,000 health apps, and not only collecting your vitals, but you know, it could be your uh, other data related to your health that gets collected. So imagine the extent of technology being used in our life to collect real world data. So until 2017, there were three, um, what, 350,000 health apps, but just in last one year, uh, about um, 90,000 new apps have been added. So look at the industry, the way it's growing fast and the usefulness of this data. Everybody is using, right? And what we do or we don't do is, whenever we uh, subscribe to an app, you just say tick, you know, I accept. We don't care, you know, just say accept and download. That's what happens because most of us will say, okay, I accept whatever data, so my right from my phone number, right from, uh, you know, my health, everything, I just say a blanket, yes, and the company becomes uh, a custodian of our data. That is one way our data is getting collected. And unfortunately, we don't really have a very strong data privacy rules in India. So, um, you know, we are still a little away from that. But 
On the other side, a lot of hospitals um, and a lot of health institutions are collecting this data in their EHR systems, which is a very, very great development and a next step to getting an access to real world data. So far, most of our data was written in, you know, handwritten format and just, just dumped it into uh, a particular file. My, like my mother has this big fat file. I'm sure nobody's logging that data and everything is you know, handwritten with last 20, 25 years of data. And nobody's entering the data into any system. But I'm sure your hospital has very, very sophisticated way of capturing this data and a database to analyze this data if required over a period of time. Okay, so why real world data and why real world evidence? What's, what's the big deal? Does this slide give you any idea of why? Without me telling you yet. Somebody. Sorry, what? Yeah. I mean, both are patients. Actually, these are patients as well in clinical trials, and those also are patients. Right, right, exactly. Uh, so what's your name? Yeah, so Sushmita, thanks. That, that is a perfect answer. So clinical trials, a very controlled way of conducting an experiment, right? Because as you can see, everybody looks pretty much similar to each other, right? Everybody is wearing a blue dress, everybody is wearing a black dress, or what the way, whatever way you guys want to define it. It's a very controlled environment, and the investigator or the sponsor gets to choose, which is called as inclusion-exclusion criteria, that I want patients between 18 to, say, 65 years of age. I don't want patients with comorbidities that uh, have liver and kidney disease. I don't want certain ethnicity. Uh, or if I'm conducting a trial in, uh, say, North America, I may not have enough representation of people from, uh, you know, Indian subcontinent or, um, say, Japanese uh, uh, or Far East side of the world. So this is a very, very controlled environment. However, in real world situation, it is entirely different. Look at the heterogeneity or look at the uh, diversity of patient population. Everything, it just gets into a very uncontrolled environment, and then you see patients who are either 65 years, uh, more than 65 years of age, you will see the old patients who have kidney disease, who have a cardiovascular dysfunction, you will have um, what a liver disease, and so on and so forth. So reality is very hard. And you can't say that I will not give the patient, um, you know, a COVID vaccine because this patient has, say, um, say kidney disease. I mean, if it's required, there will be a risk and benefit ratio that a doctor will exercise, and that patient will be given that particular medicine. And uh, if we move beyond, um, uh, say, comorbidities that we just now spoke of, right, there is a certain population that never gets into clinical trials. The reason is because they are minority population, you know, they never represent the larger chunk of population. I'll give you an example, uh, breast cancer, right? Most of us know breast cancer is very, um, uh, very, very prevalent in females, but there is a small percentage or a very small percentage of population where breast cancer also happens in men. Now, there was this one study um, that was conducted um, in the US, I think, 2022, where they identified 2,700 black African men who had uh, breast cancer, and out of that, 539 were expected to die. They, they were, you know, tracking those patients on a real-world um, uh, databases. But these patients never made it to the clinical trial. Why? Because that population is so small. They are susceptible, but they never make it because breast cancer is typically related to a female disease. But yes, there is something that needs attention. And Pfizer, in 2019, launched a drug called Ibrance. Go and look it up on Google or internet. But Ibrance was launched by Pfizer based on the effectiveness of this particular molecule in the real world settings. So the drug was already launched uh, at some point in time for female breast cancer. I think, I, I don't recollect which, which types, but uh, 
based on real world data, they were able to establish the effectiveness of uh, the drug even in uh, uh, male breast cancers and the indication was added to the labeling, um, uh, labeling information. So this is the power of real world data. I mean, why it is so important to also look at what happens to the real world um, uh, population and how a drug can also be effective in a real world population. So as we spoke, um, real world, uh, why real world evidence? Because clinical trials are a very controlled environment. The limited diversity and patient pool, as we just spoke, patient selection basis is very specific to inclusion exclusion. As I said, 18 to 65 years of age. But what if somebody who is over 65 years of age needs it? If like my mother is 67 years, should she take a medicine or not? Absolutely she should because her disease requires it. But that's the real world data and you need real world evidence from that. Cannot be always correlated and generalized to patients in the real world and hence you need real world data to find out what's really happening in real world. Issues faced by healthcare payers, regulatory authorities and health technology assessments in reimbursing costs based on limited data from clinical trials may pose a risk. Now all of us know the insurance uh, industry is very large in the US and they very, very largely depend on the data from the real world to be able to uh, define the reimbursement cost for insurance claims. So this is very, very important for them also to understand the, the pattern of disease progression, the, um, uh, the, the response of certain patients in certain cases to be able to justify saying that if this particular disease, the insurance company will pay only X, per, X dollars uh, for the treatment and not like, you know, $100,000 that the patient is asking for because they are also running their business, they also need to justify why they are paying certain amount. Effective and better treatment options for patients, obviously, we spoke about a cancer drug effective uh, in male, male uh, breast cancer, and optimized treatment duration, cost and profit margins for the providers and the pharma companies. Um, we already spoke about this, and in uh, interest of time, I'm gonna skip this slide, but pretty much everything that I have spoken uh, so far. Um, let's look at RWE or RWD as an aid to clinical trials. Uh, RWD are more suited for larger patient pools and longer duration. Clinical trials are very controlled. You know, two years of duration, four years of duration. But there was a registry that ran for 17 years that was done by a Harvard, um, uh, for a Harvard study. And they looked at the data for 17 years to, to kind of justify why a certain drug needs to be in the market. There was a device that was launched in 2011 uh, for a valve replacement, and I'm gonna talk about it in the subsequent slide. But they looked at the data for five to seven years before they approved the drug for additional indications. So it is a very powerful tool um, where the diversity of the patients is also um, considered and it gives a reflection of what happens in the real world. So while RCTs are considered as the gold standard uh, for testing the e efficacy and safety of a particular molecule or a disease, RWD or RWE uh, play a very complementary role with a picture of the real life scenario in terms of what really happens. So in clinical trials, somebody may say that there was no side effect. But when it comes into the real, real world, uh, different population, different DNA structures, uh, different genetic uh, pool of patients, the drug might suddenly show some entirely different effect, right? And that's, it's very, very important to have that data as well for more information and better uh, decisions. Let's look at why, when did this entire thing start? You know, why and what is the overall background of collection of real world data and real world evidence and how it has evolved over a period of time. So as I said, there was this um, company called Edward Life Sciences in the, U uh, in the United States and they launched a, um, a heart replacement valve in 2020 for a specific cardiovascular uh, condition. I'm not getting into the details. I'm not a medic, so you know, pardon me for that. But what they also did is they continued to monitor the data over a period of next five to six years, and then they found that it was also beneficial 
in certain other uh, cardiovascular related uh, conditions. So they went to FDA, US FDA, and then they uh, submitted their real world uh, evidence data. They, they looked at the real world data, and FDA approved their, uh, uh, the, their application for additional uh, uh, indications. So they were already doing it for an indication A. The indication B got added based on the registry data that they collected over a five to six years uh, period. And that happened in 2017. Now, 2016, um, uh, United States also had a 21st Century Cures Act um, that mandated uh, the industry and uh, the US FDA to look at usefulness of the real world data and uh, develop uh, programs and develop guidelines for use of real world data and acceptance of real world data to look at regulatory approvals in terms of what data should be collected, what standards of data should be there, what databases should be utilized, what format of the data should be there, what should the data, um, inform what information should the data give you. All of this is clearly defined by the US FDA's uh, standard guidelines that are available on the US FDA website. Feel free to go and look at it. And following years, um, uh, the EMA also published their guidelines in 2018. 2019, Healthcare uh, Canada uh, approved their own guideline in terms of how real world data should be collected and reported. And MHRA guidance uh, has also been recently uh, launched in 2021. So there is, this has been a very, uh, very interesting journey of uh, the regulators looking at the data collected in a very systematic manner versus now regulators being open to uh, the uh, idea of looking at real world data to generate certain uh, hypothesis or to generate uh, certain intelligent messages coming out of the data. Um, as we spoke, this is again, uh, I have only five minutes, so I am going to run through these slides, but as uh, Mr. Moindon also mentioned that uh, I'm around for some time, feel free to chat up. Uh, Let's talk, uh, let's, sorry, let's take a look at the recent approvals, the FDA approval, uh, approvals that have happened uh, over a period of time. There were 38 approvals based on real world evidence submission in the last decade with two in 2022. I'll give you some names a little later on. And, uh, but look at, the, look at the power of the companies and the power of regulators to appreciate the usefulness of the real world data and uh, the readiness of the industry to start collecting this data in a specific format, in a specific way, so that the regulators are able to appreciate and approve their medicines. Two thirds of these approvals are in rare diseases, oncology, therapeutic area. Rare diseases, obviously, because uh, of the ethical reasons, and oncology, obviously, as I said, there's a requirement for cancer drugs all over the world. These reports are available in the references. I've already given you some references, so feel free to check them out. Types of RWE studies. Um, there are multiple RWE studies, like case control studies, observational uh, registry studies, uh, one of the very popular ones. Cross-sectional, prospective, retrospective. Retrospective is when you look at the data from the past, and prospective is you proactively plan a study to you know, look at certain elements from the real world uh, situations. I will not get into the details uh, because that's a little out of the scope for our today's discussion. But the bottom line is none of these studies are an ideal way to collect the real world um, uh, data or evidence. What we need to bear in mind is first we need to, need to define our problem and define the readiness of our data. Based on that, we decide the type of real world study that will suit our requirements. So one can go through any one of these, but the data needs to be ready, and it also needs to mainly uh, address the objective or the question that you have in mind. Why are you doing a real world study? And if that gets answered by any of these studies, then that's the way to uh, conduct the study, or that's the model for you to conduct a, study, a particular study. We spoke about challenges uh, some time back. Uh, Real world is not ideal. All of us know that, right? 
so many variations in the real world. So there are data silos. Everybody collects their data in different way, different systems, different manners. What you collect is going to be very different as compared to the Apollo hospitals, very, compared, very different as compared to somebody collecting in, say, Hiranandani Hospital in Mumbai. So there are different silos. There are divisions in the way people are collecting their data. There are disparate data types, structured versus unstructured data, selection bias. Uh, certain patients' uh, data may not get collected because it's just not available. But that could create certain type of a bias, right? Uh, different codes and dictionaries. Uh, Mr. Moindon did speak about dictionaries like MEDRA and ICD-9, etc., ICD-10, etc. So what if somebody is using a different version of a dictionary or they have their own way to define a particular uh, condition? So that also creates problems. Multiple languages, translation issues, data privacy issues, especially related to data coming from social media, which is um, you know, not anonymized, and uh, cost of acquiring this data and data integration. Cost is a very, very big factor. And uh, one of the surveys uh, did attribute about 10% of challenges to the cost, 40% of challenges to the quality of the data that uh, gets generated. This, this survey was done by clinical leader. and. Uh, about another 40% with uh, the readiness of the regulators to be able to uh, accept the data that's being presented. So that's a big question or a big challenge today. Um, use of real world in clinical trials, specifically study startup uh, to categorize patients into certain cohorts or certain groups or clusters based on their disease patterns or disease progression, uh, determine which treatments uh, work most effectively so that the clinical trial happens um, as planned because if the patients don't stick to their schedules, if the patient don't respond to their treatments, then the clinical trial timetable goes completely uh, you know, haywire. So it's very important to identify certain patients that are likely to benefit and then they are likely to respond well to certain medications. And that's how you identify that from the real world population and ensure those types of patients that come into the clinical trials. Uh, it's also used for remote patient monitoring, like using variables and improve the data quality, like sleep, vitals, oxygen level, temperature, cough, et cetera. That was very, very well used in the COVID studies. Because if you ask the patient uh, to say, you know, what are your oxygen levels, half of them are not going to know what are the oxygen levels. So if you have... Um, a device to measure it for them, and the data directly goes into a healthcare, healthcare system, that's the best way to identify um, or collect the data. And uh, the for the trials for precision medicine and uh, especially for rare diseases and uh, creation of synthetic arms. I will not go into what are synthetic arms because again, that's a slightly different level of discussion, plus I have probably one minute now. So. Again, uh, running through certain slides, uh, data is collected from EHR. Uh, data comes from diagnosis, medical history, treatment plans, immunization schedules, allergies, pharmacy records, labs, x-rays. All of this data gets into a patient's medical records or a health record. And the data is available for anybody to do any kind of analysis. You know, how many patients have come to the hospital who are given, um, say what, um, ivermectin for uh, COVID? You know, that's the way to kind of slice and dice the data and trying to figure out, can these patients be ca carried forward for another COVID study, you know, at another hospital center, so so on and so forth. Registries are long-term uh, studies uh, conducted to look at the disease pattern and uh, the, uh, the way drugs behave in, in real-world situations. And registries are very, very important for pharma companies to plan their uh, future studies as well as giving inputs into the planning of studies and also giving strategic inputs into sales and marketing, the pipeline development. Uh, you know, they, they probably see a cancer um, trend of a certain kind in certain patients, in a certain population, in a certain region. Is there a merit in trying to develop a drug from that portfolio, that particular um, disease pattern? So these things will come from only real world data, once you start slicing and dicing the data, once you start analyzing the data, these are the patterns that will come up and help pharma companies to progress further for their decision making. Okay, I'm not going to talk about 
all the numbers because they are pretty uh, much on the screen in terms of uh, you know how many percentage of real world studies and so on and so forth. But if you recall, uh, there is a drug by Novartis. I mean, it's it's on the uh, on the screen. So these are some of the names of uh, drugs uh, that have been used, uh, or rather, they have used real world evidence or real world data in the recent times as an aid to their regulatory approvals. And if you know, there was this uh, uh, medicine by Novartis, it's called, uh, yeah, time is up, uh, which costs about 16 crore, uh, 16 crores for one dose. It's a single dose medicine. It's called uh, Zolgensma or Zolgensma, I don't know how they pronounce it, but most of you must have read it. There was this uh, crowdfunding that was going on all over the place for uh, this small girl from, a baby from Nagpur who was collecting uh, donations for her dose and this was the medicine. But this, this particular thing did utilize uh, real world data for approval. So the, the point is such medicines do come to market based on data collected from real world. COVID, uh, just one second, COVID, a lot of data, data was collected, um, you know, uh, routes of transmission, severity, uh, subset of population, repurposing of drugs. There were a lot of drugs that got repurposed like ivermectin, um, chloroquine, uh, what else? Um, something else also, right? Everything and anything that was getting, uh, you know, uh, in, in the way of, uh, or in a medi medicine box was being considered for COVID and people were trying pretty much everything for COVID. So a lot of information did get uh, collected in the real world during COVID times. And you know, some of the examples are written here. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the details, feel free to read it. And yeah, that's my last slide. So uh, in, a, in a nutshell, what I wanted to tell you is, a lot of data does get collected in the real world. The medicines do behave very differently in the real world as compared to a controlled environment um, of a clinical trial. And that data is very, very important and very valuable for all of us to, uh, so example that I remember is some clots happening in um, patients who took a particular COVID vaccine. They never found it in clinical trials, but when it came to real world, people started getting clots and somebody got a cardiovascular side effects. And this came to light only in the real world situation. So this is the power of real world. And based on that, a labeling change was made to the vaccine uh, by the vaccine manufacturer saying that this is uh, you know, likely to uh, create clots for certain uh, category of patients. So one needs to exercise caution to do that. So that is the importance and significance of real world data. It's used in clinical trials. People are finding a lot of value in doing that. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting and emerging field. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to end my uh, session today. I know I've, uh, I'm two minutes late, but uh, thanks for your uh, patient listening. And uh, I hope you found it useful. Thank you.